Um, and we're going to talk today more about how we measure sea level. So we talked on Monday a lot about the different sources of sea level, how it was changing in the past, how it might uh, sort of increase in the future due to different components like thermal expansion, groundwater use, and the melting of glaciers, and mainly our big ice sheets. And we saw that, at least until recently, we've uh, thermal expansion, that expansion of water as it warms up, has, has really played a huge role in, in the sea level rise we've seen and will continue to do so for centuries to come. But what we're really mainly concerned about is will Antarctica and Greenland melt? If so, how much and how quickly will they melt? Because that will have a real impact on our civilization potentially. So today we're going to look at some of the evidence we have for what is happening to Greenland and Antarctica. Um, we're going to look at some of the most recent discoveries just from the past couple of years. We've been learning some very new things. And then we're going to talk in quite exhaustive detail about uh, sea level, how we measure it, what factors control it. And uh, it's a little bit more difficult sometimes than you might think. So before I move on, that is not right, I'm sorry. Ignore the dry top bit. I haven't got a date for the final review session yet. I'm sorry. I don't know how that snuck in. So, ignore the top bit. Final review session is still to be announced because they haven't let me know if we can get a room yet, but there will be one, okay? Um, but other admin assignments, uh, so all remaining extra credit assignments are due by midnight on this coming Sunday. So if you haven't had a chance to do it and you would like to, uh, then uh, feel free to do that. I will grade it probably over the weekend um, and next week, and so I will try and get those scores up as soon as I can. But I have 740 students this quarter, and everyone's doing extra credit, um, so it's going to take me a little while, so please do be patient. Does someone have a question? No? Okay. Um, the other thing I want to say is that there will be no regrades after the final. Because people come to me and say, oh, I only needed that point something percent to get a B plus or something. I went through all my exams and I found this spot where I think I, I'm owed a point. And that's not going to work with me. So if you think that you have been uh, sort of unfairly treated in some way or if we haven't added up correctly, please do come see me before the final. There will be no regrades on discussions, uh, quizzes or exams after the final. If you haven't got your midterm back yet, um, we will have them in the TA review session next week. I also have them in my office, so if you can call past during office hours or just sort of call past sometime, I can uh, give them back to you. Any questions about that? Nope? Okay, so the final itself, it will be a week on Friday, so we've got quite a long time still to go. Um, and it's going from 1.30 to 3.30. You know me, I like long exams. Um, so it will probably take a good chunk of that because I would like to give you the chance to show me what you know now that you know so much. Um, so it's the same format. There'll be sort of 50 multiple choice or so, and then 50 or 60 short answer questions depending on how I write it. Okay, and so there will be assigned seating. If you haven't emailed me already um, then to let me know that you're left-handed, then do so. Um, but I still do have the list from midterm one and two. So if you've already emailed me, you shouldn't have to do that again. Um, so you will need a study guide, oh, sorry, not a study guide, a Scantron form, um, pencil and student photo ID. Um, but uh, you can also bring with you, if you like, um, a three by five uh, study sort of note card um, with notes on it, okay? So if you would like to bring a note card of notes with you, you are welcome to do that, but just one, please. It can be double-sided though. Um, and so a study guide is available on the class website, has been for a while. Um, you can access quiz answers and midterm answers by looking online, um, so I encourage you to do that. I will be available in my office um, not, I have to duck out for a meeting from 11 till 11.30, but otherwise I will be in my office on Thursday morning if you have any questions you would like to go through. Does anyone have questions about the final? No, it's the same as the other ones, so uh, just keep going with that. So let us think a little bit about our ice sheets. So we talked about where that sort of fresh water was on Earth, and most of it is in our ice sheets. It really is sort of where uh, we have a huge amount of water stored today. 
And so as a quick reminder, we talked a little bit about some of these techniques when we talked about measuring glaciers. Um, but just sort of to come back briefly to this idea that to monitor ice sheets is a really difficult thing to do. They're continent-sized blocks of ice. Antarctica is the same size as the US and Mexico combined. So monitoring how much water is sort of melting at the front or how much snowfall is being added is obviously really difficult to do, if not impossible to do manually um, by sort of direct observations. But what we can do now that we have satellites is uh, do a much better job of looking really at a continent sized scale at what might be happening. And so, as a reminder, one way that we have of studying Earth's surface is by using radar altimetry. And this idea is, is that either satellites or planes that have um, sort of GPS attached to them and will fly over the ice sheet or over water or over any surface, they emit radio waves to the surface and then those radio waves will bounce back to the satellite. And if the satellite measures how long it took for that uh, radio wave to bounce back from the surface, it can work out how high above Earth's surface it is. Okay, And so what we can do with ice sheets is by taking repeated measurements, we can get a sense of whether the surface of the ice sheet is going down, is there melting, or are we getting snowfall, is that surface actually rising. Okay. We can do a very, very similar thing with lasers. So it's still part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but this time the wavelength is slightly different. So lasers, again, if we have satellites or planes that know their position relatively precisely, they can beam lasers down at the surface. And again, they time the amount uh, or the, the length of time it takes for that signal to bounce back up to that plane or that satellite. And again, it gives that distance from the plane or satellite to the surface. So again, if you're seeing changes in, in your altitude of your ice sheet, you can get a sense of what's happening. So, because we haven't had a maths question for a while, and I know how much you miss it. If a satellite is orbiting above the Earth and beams down radio waves, those radio waves travel at the speed of sound, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, a uh, speed of sound, speed of light rather, 300,000 kilometers per second. And it takes 0.02 seconds for the satellite to receive the reflected radio waves. So how far above the Earth is the satellite? So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about it, scribble down some, uh, some calculations. Any more answers? OK, so let's see how alert you are in week 10 of the class. Not alert enough. What did you fall for? What's happening? Everyone's doing this for me at the back. Absolutely. So what does that time actually represent? The time it takes to go down and back up again. So what is my answer, actually? 3,000, right? So if it takes 0 0.02 seconds to travel down to the Earth and back up again, then one, one way, so one direction is 0 0.01 seconds. So if we times that 300,000 by 0 0.01, we get 3,000. Does that make sense now? OK, so <laughs> well done to the people that put B. Well done to my 37%. Obviously, have had more sleep in the recent days than the rest of you. OK, so there are some significant problems of using this. And that is, is that it's not terribly accurate unless we have really big changes to measure. And so it's still, I think, pretty astounding that we can do this. But really, the sort of resolution they have is that they can only measure sort of 10 centimeters or so. So the change has to be bigger than that 10 centimeters in order for that satellite to be able to measure it. It also doesn't work particularly with steep slopes. Just, do you remember that if you're beaming down a laser, it has to beam back up to the satellite if it hits a mountain and heads off sideways, then we're not going to get enough signal back to really help us out. I and mean, it also doesn't take into account the density, if you remember. So yes, if we're seeing a melt of, of sort of ice or snow, then we're going to see a change in the mass of ice. But really, it, whether it's snow or ice will have a big difference about actually how much weight and mass is being lost. So we do need to find another way. 
And that other way is what you talked about in discussion, I think, a couple of weeks ago now, which is grace. I can't really emphasize enough how much of a difference grace has made to being able to assess the changes in mass happening uh, on the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet. And so grace has its own problems. It can't really tell us what little individual glaciers are doing because it really has to work on a much more regional scale. But if we're talking about continental sized areas of ice, then actually it's perfect for telling us what we want to, to know. Because instead of now just sort of measuring the height and we have to work out exactly how much mass difference that is, now it's telling us directly because it's measuring the gravity change exactly how much mass is being added or lost. Um, and so you've seen some of these examples of Greenland um, in the discussion and how we're losing sort of big chunks down in the southern end of Greenland and at the edges. Okay. So what we can do is uh, we can actually compare those different methods and see what sort of results they give us. Because obviously, if they overlap, then we can have a certain amount of faith that actually we're measuring something that's right. Um, if not, then we perhaps need to go back and think again about what might be happening. So uh, the red bars there represent something called an input-output method. It's to do with more sort of looking at the speed of glaciers. Um, and sort of trying to measure how much is coming off the ice sheet and how much is being added. So that's one we haven't really talked about as much. And you can see that the error bars on that are really big. So we're not as certain about that method in general. And then we have in sort of pale blue or green, we have our altimetry, either radar or laser. And then we have in, in sort of darker blue, we have our gravim gravimetry. I don't know how to say that word properly, um, are grace satellites actually measuring that mass. And you can see that they sort of agree. They definitely agree for places like the Antarctic Peninsula. They're close enough for East Antarctica and West Antarctica. But definitely, when we sort of add them all together, we start to see that there are actually quite large differences between those different methods. Um, but grace is a pretty good one uh, looking at sort of the, the range in, in mass change. Okay. So in general, if you look, according to these methods when this graph was produced at least, we were really pretty confident that Greenland is losing ice. If we look at Antarctica, then it was a much less certain. It depended which method you looked at as to whether Antarctica was actually gaining mass or losing mass. We're really getting much more certain that Antarctica is actually losing mass. We think, well, we thought that um, we would be compensated for that by increases in precipitation from our warmer atmosphere, but we don't seem to be seeing that yet, at least. It seems that uh, melting is winning out. And so we can also look at that spatially, which is really neat. So here shows our sort of our rate of either sort of uh, elevation change, so either an increase in height, which is represented by blue colors, or a decrease in height represented by red colors. And you can see how the Greenland ice sheet has been changing. So where is most of our melt happening on Greenland? Around the edges. Makes sense, right? It's lower down. Um, it tends to be somewhat warmer. And so it tends to be more affected by our melting. So let's look at Antarctica. So again, the same sort of color scheme. Um, and this is what's happening on Antarctica. So. Where is the greatest loss of ice occurring on Antarctica? Where are we seeing the biggest change? So any last answers? So let's see how good people are at directions. Pretty good at this one. Yes, it's West Antarctica that seems to be melting the most. That's where that collection of red is down there. And we might be losing some ice around the edges of East Antarctica, but really the West Antarctic is where we're seeing change. Much of East Antarctica doesn't really seem to be doing anything at all. And that fits with what we might expect. Okay? But do you remember I showed you this map last thing on Monday? Um, and I, I sort of mentioned that if we look at the scale here, the red colors are sort of up to 2,500 meters above sea level. The dark blues there represent actually 2,500 meters below sea level. And if you look, West Antarctica in particular has a lot of its ice that's actually resting on land that is significantly below sea level. And this is why we're more concerned about West Antarctica. That's why we split them apart when we talk about them. 
because East Antarctica is mainly sat above sea level, whereas West Antarctica is mainly sat below sea level. And what we're worried about is that if we can get water warming up and sort of starting to eat away at the edges of West Antarctica, then it could actually retreat back very quickly, similar in a way to the tidewater glaciers do in a way, because once we get sort of access of that warm water to the base of the ice sheet, then it can melt back and, and sort of start to float and move more quickly as well. So West Antarctica is something that we're really interested in. And right now we just don't have the computer models that can accurately represent these processes well enough. And so we're really interested in what's going to happen here in particular in the next sort of few centuries. So let's have a look at some of the stuff that we've really discovered in just the last two years. 2012 in particular was a big year for sort of ice sheets. Um, so we got new estimates of our ice loss and it turns out that we are losing significant amounts of ice from both Greenland and Antarctica. So we're not really uncertain about Antarctica anymore. We are definitely losing ice from there right now. And those rates are also not sort of steadily increasing, they're actually sort of, again, exponentially increasing. So that loss is uh, getting more significant. We also, around sort of 2012 or so, found that really old ice at the bottom of our ice cores in Greenland, which gave us our sort of evidence that it couldn't have been the Greenland ice sheet that melted away completely and gave us six meters of sea level rise in the last interglacial. Actually, it could probably only have given us about three meters. And that's really good news if we're talking about Greenland, because it means that it's more stable than we thought. But what that is bad news for is West Antarctica, because that extra three meters of sea level has to come from somewhere. If it's not coming from Greenland, it has to come from somewhere else. And really, the only other place that has that sort of mass is Antarctica. And so West Antarctica, that area that we just talked about, is potentially more vulnerable to warming than we had thought. And so that could be potentially bad news because that um, both Greenland and West Antarctica hold about six meters of sea level rise each. Um, so we are concerned about that. We got a lovely new temperature record from Antarctica because if you think about trying to construct temperature records back even just 100 years, there was really nobody on Antarctica 100 years ago. Um, even so, going to Europe, we probably had a few people with thermometers around measuring temperature sort of 200 years ago. But Antarctica, we really don't have that. So before satellite records, there's very little there. Um, and there's very little to check those uh, satellite records are right. Um, and so you can see that actually that warming in Western Antarctica in particular, and it's probably about twice what we thought. It probably warmed by about 2.4 degrees Celsius over the last 50 years or so. The good news is, is that that warming is, is much more dramatic than we thought, but it's still not warm enough to get it anywhere close to melt. Okay? So we're still not worried about melting away that West Antarctic ice sheet. And what we're more concerned is apparently is more likely to be the warming ocean temperatures, because that's what's going to affect its stability. But still, it's an indication that we're seeing more dramatic change than we thought. Also, 2012 was a very big year for Greenland. So in the left-hand image there shows what might be a normal pattern for summer melting on Greenland. So those red areas there represent um, areas that have melted at some point. This is what that looked like in 2012. It was a really amazing year. There were sort of the scientists up at the, the sort of taking the ice cores up on the ice sheet. And it was the first year they'd really seen melt even up at the very, very top. And it was just for a couple of days. But still, that was a pretty spectacular event. 96% of the Greenland ice sheet was melting at some point um, in that, in that uh, summer. Um, and the temperatures were 10 degrees Celsius above average. Some of that is noise, but some of that is also to do with warming. So we can look back in our ice sheets because what's really neat is that when we have this melting event, do you see where that guy's thumb is next to the ice core? You can see that there's a little clear band in there. That's what gets left behind in the ice when we have this melting event. So we can go down and we can count how often this happens. And the last time we saw something this extreme was 150 years ago. Before that, it was 700 years ago. And so we're really interested to see whether this is just a random event that happened to happen um, or 
happen to occur at a certain time? Or is this something that we're going to see more frequently um, as the world warms up? Um, and also on here, I wanted to show you that, unsurprisingly, if we melted that much of the ice sheet, there was a lot of water coming off Greenland. And this is actually a big giant digger that has been smashed into a bridge here, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, they definitely had trouble with their bridges in Greenland that year with the amount of water coming off. Okay. So overall on Greenland, um, this is just sort of, it's a melt index. So we've just sort of normalized it to a certain sort of period. What we're seeing from at least our satellite records is that we're seeing an increase in the length of the time when Greenland will melt each year, um, and also an increase in the area that melts, um, which again is fairly unsurprising if we're warming up. So Antarctica and Greenland are contributing meltwater to the, the ocean. And so what we quite like to do is quantify how much our sea level is changing um, and then sort of think about what might happen in the future. So first of all, what is sea level? So if I went, if I took you all down to the beach, because it's a pretty nice day. So if I took you all down to the beach and said, where is sea level? What are some of the problems about finding sea level? Waves, absolutely. The sea does this, okay? It doesn't often sort of sit perfectly flat. So it's sometimes difficult. We have to take out the, the sort of things like waves that can affect sea level. What else might we have to take into account? Tides, absolutely. We have high tide, low tide. Where is actually mean sea level? If we're talking about a change of sort of millimeters, we have to take out the, the things like waves and tides that affect the height of our surface, okay? So definitely, sea level is a little bit more tricky than we perhaps like to think. So how about, how do we go about measuring it? How could we measure sea level? <laughs> Anyone? How do we measure sea level? If I told you to go measure sea level, what would you do? <laughs> so did anyone do this when they were little? They would sort of, their mum would like draw a line on a, like a post or something and they would, as they grew up, they saw, saw the line. We can do the same sort of thing with sea level, right? Is we can pick a point on land and say that we're going to measure the sea level relative to that. So what we do is we average out the tides, we average out the waves, and we can say that relative to this point on the land surface, that is our sea level, okay? Um, and then we also have satellite records now, of course, only going back uh, so a few decades, um, but these actually measure sea level relative to the center of the Earth, okay? Because what might be the problem of, rel of measuring sea level at a fixed point on the land? What might be a problem of measuring sea level relative to your land? Sorry? Erosion, yeah, the land can move, right? So we're not just talking about the sea going up and down, we also have the land moving. And so here I've, I've got sort of some tide gauge readings from around the world. So we've got Stockholm, which is in Sweden, Northern Europe, for those that don't remember geography. Um, the word I can't say, which is I think Japan, um, in Bangkok, Manila, and Honolulu in Hawaii. So what's happening to our mean sea level? Can we say anything about what's happening to our mean sea level from these? Can we even say whether it's going up or down? Not really, can we? So we need to think about other things that are affecting our sea level because we can not only just have a change in the level of the ocean, but we also can have changes in the level of the land, which actually makes it a lot more tricky, right? It's not necessarily as an easy a question as we thought it might have been originally. So what we, can, what we split sea level changes into are eustatic sea level changes, and these are global changes. So if we're talking about melting of ice, adding that ice to the ocean, that's an example of a global change. We'd see that change everywhere. But we also have isostatic 
or local sea level changes, okay, which would be particular to your location. So, for example, like we had at the back, we had erosion. So if there's more erosion at one particular location, then sea level might change there more than somewhere else. Okay? So can anyone else think, apart from adding water to the ocean, what else could cause a global change in sea level? What else were we talking about on Monday that could cause a global change? Higher temperatures, thermal expansion and compression, right? Yep. So that would cause a global increase or decrease in the volume of the oceans. One of the much longer term things, we're not worried about this in the next sort of uh, 100 years, but actually the volume of our ocean basins. Okay? If we're sort of getting rid of oceans as we collide them at, at sort of convergent plate boundaries and we form new oceans like in uh, the Rift Valley in Africa today, we're changing the volume of our ocean basins. So that would affect uh, sea level worldwide. What about local? What could we do to change the land surface? What might change our land surface around here? Everyone's silent. Earthquakes, absolutely. Earthquakes might change it. OK, so not on the San Andreas, which is more or less strike slip, so it's just sliding along. But we do have other earthquakes. What else might happen? What's happening in the Central Valley to the land surface? All of those people that took ESS1 with me. What's happening to the land surface in the Central Valley? It's dropping, right? Why is it dropping? Oh my goodness, it's hard work today. OK, because we're taking out groundwater, right? So if we're taking out groundwater, the, the actual the surface of the land is dropping meters and meters. Okay, and that's another reason. So, for one of our tide gauges here, I think it's uh, Bangkok there, that rise in sea level that they're seeing, actually, some part of it might be global, but a big chunk of that is also they're taking enormous amounts of groundwater from the ground underneath them, and that's causing the land to sink down ever so slightly. Okay, um, so we've sort of mostly got there. So for eustatic, our global sea level changes, we have changes in the, the mass of the ocean, basically. Where is our water? The change in the volume of the ocean basins themselves, not important on the next 100 years, but definitely on very long geological time scales. The density of water, so whether it's sort of warmer or colder, will affect the volume that it occupies. Then we have our local sea level changes, so movement of the land surface due to sort of plate tectonics but also some things that we haven't necessarily mentioned. So things like atmospheric pressure. Do you know we often talk about high pressure areas and low pressure areas. That has a really s sort of slight change um, in sea level because there's less air pushing down in some places. Ocean currents. So along our coastline, we have a really cold ocean current that comes past. And because that water is colder, it's sort of less volume than, say, somewhere where they have warmer currents coming past. Um, so all of those things uh, might affect uh, our local sea level. So let's think about what's happening to our land surface. So definitely we have earthquakes, but in areas further north, actually by far the most important one that we're seeing is this uh, idea of glacial loading. So basically piling enormous amounts of weight onto the Earth's crust in the form of ice sheets and then melting them away again at the end of the last ice age. Okay. So this is what sort of happens is that glacial ice is sort of builds up and builds up and builds up on top of the Earth's crust. That crust is basically pushed down a bit because that crust is sort of, sort of buoyant. It's sort of floating almost on top of this sort of underlying mantle. Sometimes we call it the asthenosphere. Um, and it's plastic and it flows a bit like the way that ice does. Okay. And then, of course, once that ice melts, then all of a sudden we don't have that really heavy mass sat on top of Earth's crust anymore, and so it sort of bobs up again. Okay? The trick is, though, that that mantle, that, that flow of the mantle the outwards and then back inwards, is actually really slow. It's really slow. And so, yes, that land is going to bob back up again, but actually that happens really, really, really slowly. It's still happening today as a result of the loss of ice um, after the last ice age. 
Okay. Um, and here is a really cool image taken from um, Arctic Canada. I think it's Nunavut. Um, and this shows, like rings on a bathtub almost, where that land surface has been rising out of the ocean. So you can see those different shorelines that have formed over the last few thousand years as that land has been rising out of the ocean, which is really neat. I love this photo. Okay. And here's a map showing where that's happening. So my scale bar on this side goes from minus six, so that's where the land surface is going downwards, okay, and that's millimetres per year. And up at the top, we have 18 millimetres per year. Okay? And that's actually pretty significant. That's like 18 millimetres is like that much, okay? that much per year. It's going to have quite a big effect in sort of 10 years, 100 years. Okay? So looking at that map, tell me, where have we lost the most mass since the last ice age? What does this map tell you about that? Yep. Oh. <laughs> so over North America, we know we had a big ice sheet. I've shown you the pictures of it, right? And we can even see that today because we lost so much mass there that the crust is still bobbing back up after the last ice age when that melted back. Where else did we have more mass, it seems, um, in the last ice age? Where else do we have a big blob? Yeah, down on Antarctica, this sort of western Antarctic area. Seems like we had much more mass there in the last ice age. Okay? So, I have a question for you. If I sent you out with a tide gauge and said, you, are, you have to put this tide gauge in one of these four locations to measure global sea level rise, so not local sea level rise, we want to pick the best place we possibly can to measure global sea level change, which location would you pick? So remember, we don't want the local signal. We want what's happening worldwide due to melting ice. OK, any more votes? All right, let's take a look. So uh, 18 people want to put it in the middle of the Asian continent, which is not the best place to measure sea level, OK? <laughs> So just to make that clear. But yeah, I would agree with the majority of you, which is that um, I would put it at B. So someone who put it at B, why did you put it there? I missed that. Someone talk to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just said it was an equator. Yeah, it's pretty far away from those areas where we had ice. And so it's going to not be recording what the local land surface is doing. It's actually hopefully going to be recording what globally sea level is doing. OK, does that make sense? Yeah. So the other reason that B might be a good place to record sea level change globally is that it's not anywhere near a plate boundary. So hopefully everyone remembers this vaguely from eighth grade, that we have this theory of plate tectonics which is just amazing. It explains so much of what we couldn't really understand about geology before the 1960s. Um, and there's this idea that our Earth's surface is broken into a whole bunch of different rigid plates that sort of float on this um, sort of more, this warmer and this what we call the asthenosphere that will flow more nicely. And so where those plates meet, we have our volcanoes, we have our earthquakes. Um, and so that's where our sort of activity is happening. And so that tends to be where we have big changes in the land surface as well. And so if we look at where B is, B is on that sort of coastline of Africa there, and you can see that that's quite a long way from any particular boundary. Whereas if we were thinking about California, perhaps, say our coastline, we're actually really quite close to one of these boundaries, and we have lots of faults running just offshore um, that aren't the San Andreas, but are still uh, big faults that can cause movement. Okay. And so we have three different types of movement that can happen during earthquakes where the sort of movement of those plates is taken up. So we can have normal faults where basically those two plates are moving apart and so the land will slip down a bit. We have thrust faults where the lands, sort of the, the bits of crust are moving together and one gets pushed up over the other one. 
bless you. And then we have the strike slip, which is just where we have landsliding beside each other. Okay? So we care about sort of thrust and normal faults, because that's where we're seeing a change in height of the land surface. And so if we look at different places around the world, especially related to plate boundaries, some areas tend to be going up, some areas tend to be going down. I mean, here's an example of just what a huge change that can be, actually. So this was taken um, after an earthquake in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific in 2007. And this is the coral reef that used to be below the surface. They saw a, the land sort of rise by about three meters. Um, it was a really, really big earthquake. And you can see in that island in the distance how that line of trees used to basically meet the ocean and how it's been lifted up. Okay. So these things are really powerful and they can have a big effect on your local sea level. So my next question for you is, looking at these tide gauges, which of these tide gauges is in a location which might have experienced a big earthquake? Okay, so have a look. Which do you think might have experienced a big earthquake? And then think, did the land go up or did the land go down? Okay, so last couple of seconds. Let's take a look. So I think this is a bit of a tricky question because I think both B and C look like they've had a jump, right? But actually, the answer here would have been B, OK? So what we're looking for, for those that weren't quite certain, is a really abrupt jump in sea level. Because that earthquake happens and sort of basically instantly, right? And so here we can see this really big jump. And that actually was an earthquake. And did the land rise or did the land fall? So sea level rose, so the land fell. Yeah, OK, absolutely. So you can also see pretty abrupt changes in sea, which is why I um, can sort of sympathize with why you picked an answer. But these are not quite fast enough, probably. They're not quite instantaneous. They're pretty dramatic, but they're probably not quite um, earthquake. OK? So let's think about our sea level um, over the next sort of century or longer. So this is our reconstruction of sea level for the past 300 years or so. And so what we have to do when we are looking at global sea level is, yes, we have all of these nice tide gauges from different places. But we have to look at each of those in turn and work out, well, actually, what are they telling us? Are they telling us anything about what global sea level is doing? We have to take into account things like certain parts of the land might be subsiding or uplifting, or we might have earthquakes, or we might have this post-glacial rebound. Okay, if we look back, um, whoops, back, other way. That's what's happening in Stockholm. Stockholm's really far north in Europe. It's coming out of the ocean still. That's why sea level is falling there. These other places are, are getting earthquakes or subsidence. And so Honolulu, and off in Hawaii, which is a long way from where our ice sheets would be, it's not seeing uh, sort of plate motions necessarily. Um, that would probably be the best way of getting at our absolute sea level. So it's not an easy thing to measure, actually, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, and so we have this sort of reconstruction with our uncertainty either side, so from 1700s up to sort of 2000. And you can see that it's been pretty steady up to maybe 1900. And then we started seeing this increase, and this increase has been accelerating. And so what we want to know is basically what is going to happen next. That is our big question. And that's what, if you were going to build a house near the ocean, you'd want to know, right? And again, it depends on what we do. So we, again, once uh, have a range. But if we could pin down more precisely what humans are going to do, we could give you a much better idea of what that range might be. So do you remember a long time ago now, we talked about representative concentration pathways. Um, and we talked about whether uh, we were being optimistic, in which case we said that by 2100 there would be an extra 2.6 watts of warming per meter squared um, of the Earth's surface. 
or whether we were pessimistic and whether we were going to burn everything and our population was going to rise to 12 billion people. Um, and in that case, we might see something more like 8.5 watts per meter squared of warming by 2100. And unsurprisingly, if we see one or the other of those, we're going to get a different pattern in our sea level rise to do with things like thermal expansion, how much and how quickly uh, melting happens in our uh, mountain glaciers and ice sheets. So our best estimate, though, of sea level rise, even if we follow that best case scenario, which, remember, involved us peaking our emissions by like 2020 and dropping to no carbon emissions at all by 2080, that's our best case scenario and a little bit uncertain about whether that's really possible. The best case scenario there, we're still seeing a sea level rise of 28 to 61 centimeters. And I know that you're not metric, but that's sort of one foot to two feet of sea level rise, okay? It's our best case scenario. If we go to our worst case scenario, we're seeing more like half a meter um, to a meter of sea level rise, and that's more like three feet of sea level rise. Um, and that is a significant uh, change so really what we do will depend on how much we see. And again, that won't be necessarily the same everywhere because we have these regional patterns. We have this uh, land rising out of the ocean um, where we're getting this glacial rebound still. So around uh, Greenland and Antarctica, we see less of a change. We see more of a change, especially around, if you look at the, the east coast of the US, there's a particular sort of area around New York and some of that coastline where they tend to see more of a change than elsewhere. And so that's not good news for them. So A shows sort of the average. So if we just took all of those different scenarios and models and just said, what on average might we see? That's sort of what we see. So maybe half a meter in, in various places. Our best case scenario is in B. We're still seeing sort of 30 to 40 centimeters, um, potentially more in some places. Our worst case scenario by 2100 we're seeing nearly a full meter in some places, say al along that coastline of New York, and certainly a good sort of 60 centimeters perhaps even here. And remember, we're not just talking about like a seawall and the, wall, the water comes up a certain amount. If you're on Newport Beach, which is this big, long, flat beach, a rise in 60 centimeters or so is actually that average level of the water is going to move a long way inland. And that's certainly true of the East Coast as well, which is really low-lying um, and flat at the coastline. So it's not necessarily good news. And the other thing I want to say is, because we're often guilty of this when we talk about climate change, the world is not going to end in 2100, or at least I hope it won't. Um, we're going to continue after that. Certainly, I think I said, I went to a university that was a thousand years old. Um, and so we're not just planning on building for the next 100 years. What we would like to do is if you're building a building today, you probably hope that it's going to be there in a couple of hundred years, if not longer. And so actually, should we just be planning for that next 100 years? We should hopefully be planning for longer than that. Um, definitely our sort of future generations would thank us. And it's worth making the point that, remember, thermal expansion, the ocean is heating up, but it's heating up really slowly. It's going to take centuries to adjust to that new temperature. And so that thermal expansion will continue. Once Greenland gets above a certain temperature, it will just continue melting. Okay? And so if we see those sort of higher levels of temperature by the end of the century, yes, we're not instantly going to melt Greenland, but given enough time, we will melt a good chunk of Greenland. And so that sea level will continue to rise in the future, as would West Antarctica potentially. We really just don't know enough to say what might happen there. So this shows that sort of sea level um, those projections up to, say, 2100. Um, and, and then you can see what would happen by 2200, another 100 years. And it makes a significant difference. Now we're seeing anything from two to four meters. So that is, I'm about one and a half meters, even in heels. So that's two of me, potentially, and a little bit more. And then by 2300, we're seeing even more than that. Okay. So it's worth thinking about not just the next 100 years uh, when we're sort of going to see that change, but also the future as well. So on Friday, we're going to talk about how do we deal with this, okay?